The current Ukraine crisis is nothing but a sideshow. Means towards an end. The main show is about taking money out of your pocket. Yes, yours too. Whoever you are, wherever on the planet you find yourself, including the USA, you will be much poorer because of the actions of the US government. And US politicians will get richer. I will prove that to you and also explain the whole Ukraine crisis, where and why it began. But if you are impatient and want to just know what is behind the current mess and how you are losing money, you selfish bastard, go to this timestamp. But for everyone else, let me oversimplify the last 30 years of East European history. Between the years 1988 and 1991, the Soviet Union was in a bit of a pickle. This became this. And there were a couple of issues that needed to be figured out. These three were by far the biggest. 1. When Germany reunifies, will it be a NATO member or a neutral country? Two. Russian Black Sea Fleet was stationed in Sevastopol and Sevastopol was now in Ukraine and there were no other real alternative facilities in all of Black Sea. And three, Ukraine ended up with a butt load of nukes and no one wanted Ukraine to have the nukes, especially Ukraine, because maintaining nukes is expensive. So in the end, this was decided. Okay guys, Unified Germany will be a NATO member, Ukraine will return me the nukes, rent me the naval base in Sevastopol on Crimea, and if you give me a pinky promise that you will not expand further east, I will promise to respect Ukraine's border integrity and sovereignty. Right NATO? No further expansion east. Right? Absolutely. No further NATO expansion east. All right, let's have some vodka. <sighs> hey, it's just not. All right, now let's figure out how to restructure my economy and what? NATO? What is it? Yeah, about that. The Czech Republic, Poland and Hungary were feeling lonely. So I invited them to join us. But, but, but your promise. Okay, fine. As long as there are some buffer states left between us. I think I have a NATO allergy. So I really don't want you to touch my borders. NATO? NATO? Where are you going? Well, hello there, Baltic countries. You must be from Tennessee. Because you are the only tens I see. Okay guys, this is getting serious. NATO is courting Baltic countries that are awfully close to our two biggest cities. Hmm... What do democratic countries usually do when they need to communicate with other countries that something is unacceptable to them? You should write us a letter condemning our actions and explaining why you worry so much about our expansion needs. It should work. You know, power of diplomacy and all. Really? When someone was putting us into a geostrategically unacceptable position in the past, uh, we used a wee bit different solution. It was less subtle, but it worked most of the time. No worries, the letter should work. It didn't work. Well, anyway, I wonder if Russia learned any lessons from that. In the meantime, a European Union was slowly but surely expanding. And to keep it extra confusing, they also chose the color blue for their flag. And since the early 2000s, EU really did it to figure out one critical aspect as soon as possible. Hello, thank you for having me. Okay, so you, the European Union, need to figure out 
common energy policy since all our electrical grids are extremely intertwined. It's no over exaggeration that this is the biggest problem we face and solution must come as soon as possible because the current situation is untenable in long term. Cheers EU, NATO here. We agree that you should figure this out as soon as possible because otherwise you will leave yourself strategically vulnerable and energy exporting countries could put a lot of pressure on you. Thank you NATO, but we have far more pressing issues that need our immediate attention. But thank you for stopping by. Okay, so let's once and for all put an end to the true menace that plagues us. Let's finally ban straight bananas and curved cucumbers. They didn't pass the ban, but the fact that they were discussing it in the first place mm, tells you a lot. Meanwhile, Georgia was figuring out the best way how to get invaded by Russia. I don't mean this Georgia, you silly, but this Georgia, the mountainous country in South Caucasus. You see, Georgia found NATO incredibly sexy and NATO was returning the favor. In April 2008, United States and Poland wanted Georgia to join NATO. Germany and France, who feared the decision would anger Russia, said no. Instead, NATO countries assured Georgia that they would eventually join the alliance. NATO further pledged to review the decision in December 2008 at a later meeting. A week later, head of Russia military said, please don't. And since this worked as well as last time Russia tried to keep some separation from NATO, our rivals in the Georgian regions that border Russia started to be rowdy. Georgia said stop it and moved soldiers to these regions. And Russia then came to rescue ethnic Russians that faced danger from Georgians. Hmm. I wonder if we will see something like that again. Ah, we have a question from the audience. Yes, you, uh, in the back. But logical checkmate, this doesn't prove that Russia was worried about a potential invasion by NATO through Georgia. Well, about that. In 2019, Russia's foreign minister Sergei Lavrov said that if Georgia would join NATO, Russia would not be happy about it. But also that they would not start a war if those rebel regions would not come under NATO control. And you see these things? Those are the Caucasus one of the harshest mountain ranges on the planet. Good luck invading through there. And these rebel regions remain to this day only two real corridors how to get from Georgia to Russia. So, what do you think now? Anyway, let's check what the EU was up to. Okay guys, cool, we just decided that there is no evidence that drinking water prevents dehydration. Again, I'm not kidding. Oi, oi, oi. What is this? You guys seriously need to get on top of that common energy policy. It's getting really bad. How bad can it be? It has worked for the last 10 years. It's not like there's some major crisis coming. Well, about that. In Japan, they had a major earthquake, a tsunami, and a nuclear catastrophe, Fukushima. German public then demanded the shutting down of all nuclear power plants in Germany, which to be fair, it was already scheduled in order to replace them with renewable energy, but Germany hastened this move and greatly outpaced the new sources being built. They needed to expand their coal mines and increased imports of electricity from neighboring countries. They increased air pollution, killed about 1100 people a year and forced neighboring countries to expand their nuclear power. By the way, there is so far only one corp confirmed fatality as a result of radiation from Fukushima disaster. So good job Germany! Now the timeline will be really important, please pay attention to the years being mentioned. The same year Germany decided to abandon nuclear power, that is 2011, planning and administrative work on Nord Stream 2 natural gas pipeline started. This would increase the supply of cheap Russian gas and decrease air pollution in Germany. 
and plug the hole in the German energy supply. It was supposed to be decades long temporary solution on the journey to fully green energy. In 2013, Nord Stream AG company based in Germany started to obtain permits from relevant governments for this project. And before we go any further, you need to know something about harbors. You see, for a good harbor, you need a rugged coastline. Somewhere where ships will be protected against storms, waves and so on. For a military harbor, you want harbor enclosed as much as possible to easily control who or what gets in and out. Problem with the Black Sea is that the coastline is as smooth as baby bottom and decent harbors are hard to come by. Russian Black Sea fleet was stationed in two harbors, the Novorossiysk which is meh and Sevastopol. And I mean look at that, that is precisely what you want for a military naval base. Good thing for Russia that they have a good relationship with Ukraine and they can rent the naval base for Russian Black Sea Fleet to have a nice and cozy home. One problem. Pro-West Ukraine President Viktor Yushchenko vowed to kick Russians out of Sevastopol. Ukraine later had a presidential election between pro-West Yulia Tymoshenko and pro-Russia Viktor Yanukovych. And Yanukovych won. Right after he took office, he signed a deal with Russia that he would extend the lease of Sevastopol until 2042. Fast forward, the year is 2014. President Viktor Yanukovych was dragging his feet about signing a very popular agreement that would move Ukraine closer to EU membership. People of Ukraine knew something was up after President Putin came with a shiny counteroffer. Instead of getting closer to the EU, Get closer to Russia and Kazakhstan. Look at this shiny new trade deal. Hmm, shiny. We would rather if you would not. Shiny. Well, we have only one thing left to do. So people of Ukraine protested and then they protested some more. When it was clear that they are not gonna go home anytime soon, they got far dead by snipers with live ammunition. The secret police would just grab people and they would just disappear. Full on street battles went on between the people and security forces. People with homemade shields going against sniper rifles, AKs and frag grenades. Hundreds would die, many more would be abducted by secret police, never to be seen again. The bullets come directly to heart, to neck, to lungs. We're doing emergency, but we have no chance to save their life. So think about this next time when you smash a window, steal some stuff and think how brave you are. In the end, the protesters would triumph and they would oust President Yanukovych out of Ukraine. Hey, you can do that. That's illegal. That's against your constitution. Well, bloody boy, all revolutions are illegal. By this logic, Russia should become a monarchy and have descendants of Nicholas II restored as Tsars of Russia. By the way, what happened to the Romanov family? No comment. So you are thinking about joining NATO Ukraine? I definitely don't want to join, but I also want to hang out with them more. I'll be right back. Okay, Bohdan, we need to figure out how to communicate to the pro-Russian Crimea and east of Ukraine that we mean no harm despite just having the post president they overwhelmingly voted for. Hmm, that will be a tough sell, Antin. What is this? Well, I wasn't feeling like waiting around to see if you will kick the Black Sea Fleet out of Sevastopol or if you will join NATO, both of which are absolutely unacceptable to Russian security and are consistent with our overall geostrategic policy for the last 250 years. Is this really that much of a shocker? Anyway, I'm gonna start an uprising in your eastern regions to deter NATO from accepting you and since I gave a lot of people living in Crimea Russian citizenship, 
I will use this weak justification of protecting my citizens and I'm gonna yoink Crimea away from you. And he did. Also, pro-Russian separatists started to be rowdy in eastern Ukraine, which resulted in a quite brutal civil war that goes on to this day. So, why would Russia do this? First, Russia and warm water ports are like American oil. They have only two, one of which is Sevastopol. Every other port looks in winter like this. This is a big issue for any nation, but especially for one that has a powerful fleet, because they would be cut off from the rest of the world during winter. I mean, there have even been memes about this for as long as I can remember. Next, this is the Russian heartland and most of the Russian population lives here. It's just like Russia's head. And this is the Volvograd Gap. From Ukraine, it's just 700 kilometers to Astrakhan and the Caspian Sea. The distance that a modern army can cover in a day tops too, cutting off Russia from both the Black and Caspian Sea. If Russian heartland is ahead, then this is Russia's neck. And Ukraine joining NATO would be for Russia just like having an X right over it and trusting NATO that they won't swing it. And if you don't believe me, just ask Fritz. In both World Wars, Germans were trying their best to get here. If I tell you the old name of the city of Volvograd, it might jog your memory. Stalingrad. Russians lost over 1 million men and women trying to defend this city alone in order to prevent Germans from gaining this very territory. And they would have sacrificed millions more. That's how important this region is to existence of Russia. Another thing is that in this region the population is only about 30% Russian. Rest are Chechen, Avars, Dargin, Kabardinian and many many more. It's already a hotbed for separatist movements and Russia is worried about them rising up in a revolt and proclaiming independent countries. Simply put, they are worried that what is happening to Ukraine and Georgia would happen to them in the region that is crucial to the very existence of the Russian state and they worry that NATO might be nudging people here to this line of thinking, supplying them with arms and so on. Especially if you consider this. The official position of NATO is that their membership is open to any European country that can contribute to the security of Northern Atlantic. But Georgia is already in Asia. And what asset would Georgia be? Don't get me wrong, Georgians are some tough bastards and their nation produces some insane warriors. But that alone is not enough, not by far. Why would NATO want to expand to Georgia other than to have a better position against Russia? And factor in that Russia will interpret this move in the worst possible light, even if NATO's intentions are most likely peaceful. So, gives all of this Russia the right to invade their neighbors? No, of course not. Baltic countries, Georgia, Ukraine and any other sovereign nation have the right to enter any military alliance they wish. Especially since every single one of these nations was invaded and controlled in the past by Imperial and Soviet Russia, resulting in oppression and specifically in the case of Ukraine, in millions of dead. The good people died first. Those who refused to steal or to prostitute themselves died. Those who gave food to others died. Those who refused to eat corpses died. Those who refused to kill their fellow man died. Parents who resisted cannibalism died before their children did. Back to the present day. 
Yes, Russian actions against Georgia and Ukraine in 2008 and 2014 were illegal. But Russian actions could have been anticipated and prevented through diplomacy and some compromises. Yes, international law is on the side of Ukraine, but it was also on the side of Cuba in 1960s. After the failed American invasion in the Bay of Pigs, Cuba, as a sovereign nation, was looking for a military alliance. And after the USA placed Jupiter missiles in Turkey that could reach the Russian heartland, USSR felt like some reciprocity was in order and they placed missiles to Cuba. And Cuba had every right to have those nukes on their territory. They were a sovereign nation. But the reaction of the United States could have been anticipated then too and was understandable. The majority of their people were threatened with these missiles, just as the majority of Russian people would be if Ukraine would join NATO. I can be here telling you about how Russia murdered people in the United Kingdom or in my very own homeland. I can be telling you how they oppressed their own people and much, much more. But in the end, what is there to be learned from all of this is, when superpowers compete with each other, international law, right or wrong, those things don't mean much to them, except how to use it in order to benefit. I bet you must be wondering, where is the competition with the United States? Well, now that the history recap is behind us, we can get into the meat and potatoes of the current crisis. So, remember Nord Stream 2? The pipeline that was being worked on while Ukraine and Russia were at best chums? Well, it was nearly finished, costing some 10 billion euros. USA was like, nope, you guys are not doing that. Coming to a boil, three U.S. senators have uh, have told German citizens and others to, quote, cease activities supporting the construction of the pipeline or face potentially fatal measures. That is very aggressive language. These are three senators from gas producing areas, so... It's very aggressive language to yeah, an ally. Absolutely, these are senators. In face of these sanctions, private companies from eight European countries stop working on the pipeline that was from 98% finished. Hey, we consider this an intrusion on our sovereignty and we wish you to stop. We also suspect that these sanctions have less to do with us being dependent on Russia, as we claim, and more to do with USA skyrocketing LNG production and the need to find new markets. Anyway, here in this letter we say how very disappointed we are in you. I swear to take this very seriously, but excuse me for a moment. Oh, the paper is so soft. Look you, we are doing this to protect you. Well, I didn't ask. That's why we are such good friends. I do what I think is good for you, even if you don't want it. The sanctions continue and expanded to a point that Russia needed to send their state-owned ship, Academic Chersky, all the way from the other side of the world to finish the pipeline because no company in the whole of Europe would do business with them out of fear of the US sanctions. Consider the full weight of what just happened. The United States of America just decided with whom European companies can and cannot do business. That much for European sovereignty, am I right? But in any case, the pipeline was being finished despite the year-long delay. Now, if you are an American, you might be wondering why should this concern you? Well, do you remember from school how supply and demand affects the price of anything? Well, if you limit the supply of natural gas, 
in Germany save by preventing pipeline from being operational. Germany still needs the gas because they were idiots and closed up their nuclear power plants too soon. The limited supply of cheap gas from Russia means Germany needs to buy expensive LNG and ship it, say, hmm, from the USA, which just in a few years became the largest LNG exporter and coinciding with the more aggressive stance on Nord Stream 2. But this will increase the price globally because there is then a lower supply of natural gas globally. During the beginning stages of global energy crisis, meaning the price of natural gas, heating and electricity will go up all around the world, including the USA. And if you are unfamiliar with the basic effects of supply on price, then here is a scholarly article from the Institute of Energy Economics at the University of Cologne in Germany that I translated for you. So feel free to read it. This is not a matter of opinion. This is a fact as cold as it gets, but it gets even worse. Ammonia is necessary part of fertilizers and to create ammonia you need natural gas. It's a key ingredient, not to mention a lot of electricity. The prices for manufacturing ammonia are so high that European manufacturers are actually ceasing activity, meaning higher demand and prices for fertilizers all around the world, which makes food more expensive globally, including the USA. But there's still more. This will disproportionately affect the poorest countries, for example in Africa. More expensive food means more famines, less humanitarian aid to them. You get the picture. This will result in more migration, more wars, less food production and you have a negative feedback loop. Again, this is not a matter of opinion. This is fact. Yo. LC, we are selling more gas to Europe. We are making money. This is good for America. USA, USA, USA. Yeah, mate. It's true that the gas industry employs over 600,000 people in the USA. True. But this makes food, electricity and heat more expensive for 329 million US citizens. And I hope you guys are already clear about how the trickle-down economy really works. Both of you should be able to unite on this, because you both eat food, both need electricity, obviously, but poor American people that are disproportionately minorities will be hit hardest. This will also trigger famine of biblical proportions killing many, many people in Africa. And you claim you care about these things. And you must not like that this will increase the price of ammunition and increased uncontrolled migration. And many more reasons, I'm trying to be funny here. So will you, for the love of God, for once unite against a common foe? Hang on there, Buster. We did this to curb Russia's aggression because we care about international law and the territorial integrity of sovereign nations. Yep. Right. I remember that from your campaign promises. Vote for us and we will take the money out of your pockets in order to help Ukraine and the Europe, despite EU not asking us. And do you really, really care? about international law and the territorial integrity of sovereign nations? Absolutely! Yo, America, me and Saudi Arabia are entangled in the Yemeni civil war. Just before airstrikes, we killed some 9,000 civilians. Well, in total, there died some 377,000 civilians. And well, some 90,000 children died from starvation and cholera. Also, we bribed Al-Qaeda to leave some cities, in effect sponsoring a terrorist organization. Oh yeah, 
and we are also yonking away the Yemeni islands of Socotra and Mayun and taking them for ourselves. Is that cool with you? Sure. Here, have some weapons. When governments have such double standards, those are no longer standards, but only phrases to be used when they need to excuse their actions. But to summarize, overwhelming bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate pushed these sanctions even over Trump's veto. And results and effects so far are USA risked a trade war with Germany and, well, EU, treating allies as a trading colony and straining relations with partners, increasing the prices of electricity, heat and food for every American, making global famines and wars more likely and more severe. Yes. Energy prices were going to rise because of Covid and other reasons, but this whole mess around Nord Stream 2 is making it far more severe. These are facts, not opinions, and again, support for this was bipartisan. Now, why would US politicians do this? And they agreed on something so overwhelmingly, despite partisan lines. Hmm, I don't know. Maybe because oil and gas is one of the biggest donors to politicians. Just FYI, we call this in Europe corruption or at the very least conflict of interest. You guys call it a free speech. I'm just wondering, are you happy with that? Before we get back to our story, let me just tell you that the dates will be incredibly important going forward, so please pay attention to what is being circled on the screen. Holy crap guys, Russia used their state-owned ships to bypass the sanctions. No worries, I got you fam. There is a significant buildup of military forces in the western part of Russia preparing to invade Ukraine. You should seriously scrap the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Hang on, you forgot to mention that our military buildup is a military exercise Zapad. It is happening simultaneously with the largest NATO exercise in decades that takes place in Baltic and Black Sea countries. And just last year, you for the first time ever fired the High Mars rockets to the Black Sea, which, and I quote, US armies and US Marine Corps High Mars are seen as one of the pivotal key launchers for the current and future United States strategy and tactics for an anti-ship land-based weapon system that can counter peer nations shipping." Unquote. And this year you deployed whole brigades worth of this stuff. Our mission today is to work with our allies and our uh, peers here in NATO and in uh, Europe and do a uh, live fire firing uh, reduced range practice rockets along with our British counterpart. The MORS is an effective weapon system, uh, versatility, being able to fire in all weather conditions where others can't. Uh, the family of munitions, ranging from unguided to guided, our range and the lethality of the munitions. Exercise Saber Guardian is a mission that we're doing, uh, partnered with our Bulgaria allies. We're going to go out on the C-17 aircraft, download, move to a certain point, execute our fire mission, and return within the same day. This exercise is going to help us to demonstrate our capability to rapidly deploy and then integrate with our multinational partners uh, across Europe. And two peer nations to the USA are Russia and China. And China is rather far away from the Baltic and Black Sea. So it's pretty clear to whom you are sending this message. 
Not to mention that you are shipping military personnel and equipment including attack helicopters, UAVs, artillery and tanks on an unprecedented scale to the Greek port of Alexandropolis from which you can then deploy this rapidly via the railway through Bulgaria to Romania and directly threaten Crimea and our Black Sea fleet. Funny how I cannot find any mention of this shipment of US military hardware on an unprecedented scale in any American media like CNN and Fox News despite your embassy in Athens tweeting about it. See? See? Russia. Bad. Cancel Nord Stream 2. Now. And here we are right now. The war is beginning. Biden and company are for a week now saying Russia will invade any minute now. But the truth is that both sides, Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian forces are shelling each other more and more and blaming the other side. If you have side in this war, be it pro-Ukrainian slash pro-NATO slash pro-USA or pro-separatist slash pro-Russia, you will probably call me stupid Tell me that it's obvious the other side is doing the shooting and your side are innocent angels. There are so many incidents happening right now, but let me on the most famous one demonstrate the relationship between truth and war. 17th of February, the separatists have reported that Ukrainian forces have shelled a kindergarten in separatist held territory. British Prime Minister had this to say. And t today, is, as I'm sure you've already picked up, uh, a kindergarten was shelled in uh, what we're taking to be a, uh, what we know is a false flag operation uh, designed to, uh, uh, to discredit the Ukrainians, uh, designed to create a, a pretext, a, 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 a spurious provocation uh, for Russian action. Uh, we fear very much that that is the kind of thing we'll see more of over the next few days. A false flag is when you attack yourself, claim it was done by the other guy, so you have an excuse for your increased aggression. And PM Johnson is saying he knows for a fact that pro-Russian separatists shelled their own kindergarten in order to provide a pretext for Russians' increased aggression. By the way, he said we will see in the coming days more false flag operations from the separatists slash Russia. In order to state it as a fact, PM Johnson needed to see some intelligence reports, analysis of the footage, something along those lines. Something stated so definitively must have been confirmed. Well, what turned out to be the case, the kindergarten was in a Ukraine held territory. So the separatists were liars because it was a dark kindergarten hit by Ukrainian forces. Pojo is a liar because without any verification of the most basic facts, they immediately by default blamed Russia. They literally lied to us. And it was confirmed by the Western media that the pro-Russian separatists hit the kindergarten in Ukraine territory. The Ukrainian military has brought us nearly 400 miles towards the front lines in the east of the country. It's already dark by the time we land. We'll only have a short time on the ground, but they are determined to show us the aftermath of heavy shelling earlier in the day. This kindergarten is less than three miles from the so-called line of contact, the front line. And witnesses in this area said that around eight or nine o'clock this morning, they started to hear shelling. It was loud enough that they could hear the whistle of the shells going by, and two of them landed here at this kindergarten. Let's take a look. At the end of the hallway, this is what remains of the playroom. The military says the first shell hit at 8.45. Mercifully, the children were eating breakfast in another part of the building. Teacher Yulia Semenyenko tells me she immediately rushed them into the hallway, away from the windows. 
So she's saying in that moment, she was only really afraid for the children. I ask her how they reacted to the situation. Our youngest children thought it was all a game at first, and we just let them pretend, she tells us. Our older children understood what was happening, and they were afraid. Video released by Ukrainian police shows the kids being hastily evacuated from the building. Obviously, it's very dark here. I'm not sure if you can see, but this is actually a children's playground. And if you just turn over here, you can see this is a crater, and the local authorities are telling us that this is where the other shell hit. As you can see, the CNN team was flown across the whole country to take a look at the kindergarten. They were given access to the outside and inside, and it is clear as day it were the separates that endangered the poor kids there. Yeah, about that. The OSCE team is a multinational group of experts, military and civil, and tasked to monitor the situation on the ground and to provide observations and reports of what is really happening, who is shooting who, who moves weapons where, and so on. They have, according to the agreement with both Ukraine and separatists, access basically anywhere in the conflict regions. So, the OSC team went to look at the kindergarten in order to determine what weapon system was used and to objectively figure out who did it. And they were denied access by Ukrainian law enforcement because the investigation was ongoing. And they were only let to see the hole in the wall from 50 and 30 meters away. But I mean, Ukrainians maybe just got confused and then instead of CNN team, they wanted a CSI team. What are you going to do? I am going to get to the truth. So, to sum it up. One crater outside, one hole in the wall, media were allowed access and an international team of experts tasked with investigating these things was not allowed access. Those are the facts. But let's take a look at the claims of the Ukrainian side. Euromaidan Press is claiming as a fact that the kindergarten was hit by 122mm shells. Now, the only 122mm howitzer that the Russian armed forces have in service is 2A18D30, with an effective range of some 15 km, firing high explosive rounds with some 4 kilos or 9 pounds of hexal explosive. And hexal is some 50% stronger than TNT. So, 122mm high explosive round going off looks like this. So, what do you think? Russian media is reporting what the separatists tell them. Western media is reporting what Ukraine or Western powers tell them. Each side saying, it's you shooting, I'm innocent. As you can see, the violations of the ceasefire appear to be on both sides. Funny how no media is using their reports unless to nitpick something. Welcome to war, boys and girls where truth is used only when it serves. When it doesn't, it's twisted, perverted or manufactured. We've been doing this since the beginning of our species. I wonder if people will one day realize it's also their side doing it. By the way, if you still don't think this whole war thing is just a sideshow designed to push the EU away from Russia in order for American freedom cares <laughs> to have less competition on the European market from the Russian gas, hear it from their own mouth. Uh, 
getting uh, the Donbass conflict resolved. So it is a good thing that Russia chose to go to the table there, and we hope that they will similarly choose to go to the table on all of uh, the other issues that, that we have said we are more than ready to talk about. Um, with regard to Nord Stream 2, uh, we continue to have uh, very strong and clear conversations uh, with our German allies, and I want to be clear with you today. If Russia invades Ukraine, one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward. Uh, and how, do you, how can you say that for sure? Where does your confidence come from on that? As I said, we've had extensive consultations at every level uh, with our German allies. I'm not going to get into the specifics here today, but we will work with Germany to ensure that the pipeline does not move forward. Let me translate it to plain English. 1. Nord Stream 2 is the thing that's most important to them. 2. One way or another is an extremely aggressive language when it comes to diplomacy and this is prepared statement. Meaning, no matter what Germany wants to do in case of an invasion, the USA will see to it that Nord Stream 2 is not going forward. 3. Since the invasion of Ukraine is prerequisite, for scrapping Nord Stream 2, invasion is preferred over peace. And for Bratsi Asestris Ukraini, Posohite Nini Pozornia. She did not mention any guarantees for your sovereignty, your territorial integrity, or security. Meaning that if Ukraine is on fire, that is an acceptable outcome for them. And given that Biden is now saying for at least two weeks that Ukraine will get invaded any moment now, it's clear that they gave you some promises. That they will have your back urging you to go and poke that bear. Did you consider they lied? Once they have what they want, invasion of Ukraine and EU moving away from Russia, they will ditch you just like they did with Kurds, for example. You are just means towards an end. And you think their morals won't allow it? What morals? CIA, for example, once overthrew the government of Guatemala because they were passing anti-exploitation laws and fruit companies would have to pay fair wages to their workers, decreasing the profits of those companies. If they are willing to do that for some fruit companies from a poor country, imagine what they are able to do in order to secure a monopoly on the supply of energies to the EU. And I bet the goodwill of the American people is on your side, but what that can do? They don't rule their country. All it takes for the US government to get away with anything is to convince the media to tell US citizens they don't like each other. And voila! Look at Nord Stream 2! US politicians will literally steal trillions of dollars away from their own people while getting rich and their media doesn't cover it. American people are far more worried about what pronouns to use than genocide in Yemen, the fact they will get poorer, and so on. They invaded Iraq based on an objective lie, lost 4,500 countrymen. It cost them some two trillion dollars, which is enough to end the homelessness crisis in the United States. Hundred times over! And was anyone sentenced for this high treason? Did the American people hold them at least on political level responsible? Well, not only both of those parties are still in power, but the current president of the USA, Joe Biden, voted to invade Iraq. And I mean, look at how worried is the war criminal push. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. I'm not dumb, dude. I tell you. Shit! Fuck! Oh my ear! We need to get the fuck out of here. 
Nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> Dear Ukrainians, I'm in no shape or form saying, go in bed with Russia. Just be careful when it comes to dealing with the American government. They don't have your best interest in mind. Now, any story needs someone to blame. Some bad guy. Do you know who I blame for this whole mess? The EU. You a-holes. You left us in a very vulnerable position that others are now taking advantage of and Ukraine is paying the price. What did you expect? Both Bold Eagle and Brown Bear are predators. You were weak. Get strong. I don't care that the Russian people are getting oppressed. I don't care that the Americans let their politicians steal money from their pockets and putting it in the pockets of their friends. You led us into a situation where we might go to war and it will be not our choice but of the US government. And by paying the higher prices for energies, we are effectively paying tax to the US government. And as in late 1700s was set on the other side of the pond. No taxation without representation. Sort it out soon or we, the people of the EU, will declare you out of a job soon. If you open the Nord Stream 2, it will make you too dependent on Russia for energy. Better import freedom gas via ships. Hang on. But if we will open Nord Stream 2, the ports will not magically close. You absolute f